This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 285, recorded on March 30th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone, and you can actually see me today. <laughs> we're, we're doing an experiment. We're, we're trying a new streaming platform without Michelle and Petra, so that Vincent and I can work out the kinks, just like all good experimentalists, before we deploy it in the lab. Yeah, we're we're experimentalists. We're willing to try weird things like this, and uh, it's a new streaming platform. And I I can do live switching like I just did, so I can save editing, and uh, maybe this will replace all of my uh, recording for podcasts. You know, it's. Uh, it looks very good to me. We'll see how the final product looks. Anyway, we are going to uh, talk to you about a little bit of science. But uh, before I do that, I just wanted to tell everyone we have a, a Discord server. Uh, if you don't know what that is, probably you don't need to know. <laughs> but it, what it is, it's a chat community. You go there and you type. And there are other people who are interested in microbiology and virology and all the subjects of our podcasts. Uh, they go there and they just talk and it's 24-7. Sometimes I'm there. Sometimes some of the other hosts are there. Did you join the Discord server, Michael? I haven't joined the Discord server simply because I've been teaching two classes this semester okay. and I'm yeah, overwhelmed. But um, I'll put a link in the show notes, microbe.tv slash twim. And you can sign up. It's free. It's easy to do. And, and it's a cool community. We have 800 people so far who love to talk about viruses, bacteria, parasites, immune responses, neuroscience, all of our cool podcast topics. So check that as, out. As my grandmother would have said, from <laughs> soup to nuts. Yeah, from soup to from nuts. Soup That's to a good nuts. one. All right. Let me start off with a snippet published in Cell, Host, and Microbe. And of course, since it's me, it's got to have a virus involved, right? Oh, yes. Although I have done non-virus papers. You yeah. Know, I, I, I can learn. As Elio said, I can learn. But um, <laughs> this is called A Widespread Family of Phage-Inducible Chromosomal Islands Only Steals Bacteriophage Tails to Spread in Nature. It caught my eye. Actually, it's a number of months ago. Uh, it caught my eye, and I thought, when it's my turn, I shall do a January. Uh, this year it was published. So the uh, we have two co-first authors, Nasser Al-Kurani Al and Laura Miguel Romero, the uh, corresponding author. Well, we have two. We have uh, Alfred Filo Salam and Jose Peñades. And these are from University of Glasgow, King Saud bin Abdulaziz University for Health Sciences. That's in Saudi Arabia. Imperial College London, mm. Université de Paris Cité, National University of Singapore, and the Universidad CEU Cardenal Herrera, which is in Spain. And this is about satellites, not the kind that are up in space, but viral satellites. In my virology course, I, I teach about eukaryotic viral satellites. And these are viruses that can't do it on their own. They need some help. <laughs> and the help comes in the form of a helper virus, as we call it. So we call them satellites. And you know, the, the nomenclature people are up in arms. They just want to mm -hmm. call them viruses because they don't like this idea that there's something different, a satellite. They're just missing a few things. And the point they make, it's quite interesting. So the satellites often require capsid proteins or structural proteins from the helper virus. Okay? Hold on. Uh-oh. 
I just want to start my. I just wanted to start my audio backup because. Okay, that's good because we're doing an experiment. <laughs> yeah, and if, if it didn't work, I had at least I'd have an audio. I do a video and an audio backup. Okay, we got that going. Of course, I, mi I missed the first five minutes, but it's okay. Everything's going to be fine. So satellites usually require uh, capsid proteins from the helper virus, and the the people who work on them who don't want it to be called satellites, they say, well, you know. A lot of viruses don't do transcription on their own. They depend on the host cell. So what's yeah. the difference if you depend on a cell or another virus? And it's a good point, right? It's a transacting factor that matters not where it comes from. Yeah, so I don't see why we should call them satellites. But anyway, it's it's ensconced in the prokaryotic world, so we're not going to yes. change that. Uh, and um, so here, this paper is all about phage satellites, and most the ones that are known so far, um, they they require something from their helper virus, but they also inhibit the helper virus. They inhibit the reproduction, uh, which is which is not good for the helper, of course. But that's the way it goes. And and there are tons of these all over, many many thousands of uh, hundreds of different bacterial species, thousands of different kinds of these satellite uh, elements. Um, but um, what's cool, and this, this is very cool, they, these uh, satellites have ways to promote their genome preferentially getting into the capsid, right? Because here, the helper virus is providing a capsid. Think of one of those uh, bacteriophages, you know, with the icosahedral head and the, the tail and the tail fibers. The, the, the satellites have to get those capsid proteins. Uh, Filled with DNA. They have to put they their to DNA in up. it. So one strategy to, to preferentially encapsidate their own DNA is to somehow make the capsid smaller so the helper DNA doesn't fit in it. Isn't that so insidious, isn't it? <laughs> it, it it's really quite evolutionarily clever. Very. Because, if, we can, if we can say viruses are clever, right? We shouldn't yeah. say that, but. Well, we shouldn't say it, but it, you know, from an evolution perspective, you can understand the selection pressure that would drive it mm. because their genes would be deposited vertically into the next generation. For sure. So, uh, they're, they're not, this is cool because how do you make the capsid smaller? So these helpers, these, these satellites have proteins that alter <laughs> the structure of the capsid and make it smaller. Isn't that amazing? It's so cool. It, 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 it's it's really wild that they're able to accomplish, that the virus is able to accomplish this all without forethought. This is all natural selection driving this truck, so to speak. Oh, it's all natural selection. And, and in fact, one, one, thing that, one thing I was looking at this morning, in, in this sentence, in the second paragraph, they, they write, the authors write, satellites have evolved different strategies to promote their preferential packaging. Actually, they have not. That sounds like the virus has done it. The virus had nothing yes. to do with it. Evolution doesn't really care about you. It just no. happens, right? It's natural selection, and the virus changes, and then the selective forces acts on the virus. So to say the virus has evolved gives the impression that the viruses are directing the evolution, and they are not. They're absolutely not. So that's important to understand. Uh, so also, these uh, <clears throat> satellites have proteins that um, preferentially direct their DNA into the capsids as well, because there are packaging signals on the on the nucleic acids on the DNA that interact with capsid proteins. So they also mess with that. So quite amazing uh, strategies. So. Um, so far, all of the helpers uh, make all the proteins, all the structural proteins needed to make infectious satellites, which uh, they call um, by a different name, which is PICI, phage-inducible chromosomal island. So these, these genomes all, all reside in a, in a certain part of the chromosomal DNA, which is called an island. And... Um, but They're I, very I, similar to pathogenicity islands right. in the prokaryotic world. You know, bacteria have these islands that confer fitness strategies that enables a bacterium to become virulent in a host. Right. And these this does not happen in eukaryotic 
satellites. No. They're not they're not integrated into the host. So this is more of a prokaryotic thing where the host cell is carrying all these helpers and satellites and so forth. Um, in the um, eukaryotic world, they're just existing as virus particles and going from host to host. Anyway, so all the helpers we know so far provide all the capsid proteins. And here, this paper is de now describing an unusual <laughs> satellite where it makes its own capsid proteins and all it needs from the helper are the tails, the phage tails. <laughs> you know, those little whisper, whisker-like things that come off of the... Uh, the, um, the phage head, <sighs> the landing gear, so to speak. So you have the it head, then you have an, uh, a tail, and then I guess the whole tail, and then the, f the tail fibers are something in addition to that, right? Those little right. hairy they, things. They effectively yeah. are like the landing gear on the lunar module. Yeah. They effectively are out there, and when they encounter the bacterial receptor that uh, enables the phage to attach to its host, the bacterium, oftentimes they have actin-like activity and they can uh, contract and actually then facilitate the entry of the nucleic acid or the injection of the nucleic acid into the host. And Vincent's got a model that we can all now see. All right, look at this. So this is a uh, crocheted bacteriophage. Let me put it in front of the light there. And this was sent to me by um, a former student of Mark Martin's, whose name I forget. She makes these. But Mark Martin had it sent. So here's the head, the icosahedral head. And there's the tail, right, attached to it. And these are the tail fibers coming off, right? So that's what we're talking about today, the, the tail. And, and so, Michael, um, these phages don't have tail fibers, if I remember, right? Yes, they I don't. Because they have a lot of EMs here. Like yes. Micro yeah, there are no tail fibers. They're just straight, no. straight tails. They're just straight, straight tails. All right. So that's the discovery of this paper, and uh, I'll just snippet you through it. Uh, so <laughs> they said uh, they were looking at genes in, in uh, E. coli for these, uh, these phage-induced chromosomal islands, and they said one of them raised our curiosity— uh, it had an unusual genetic organization because it had it seemed to encode all the proteins needed to make capsids, um, but it didn't have <laughs> it didn't have the tail proteins, which are known for for many of these viruses. So it was missing a piece, missing a missing piece. link, so to so that's missing cool. link, so to speak. It got their attention, and so they decided to. Uh, start studying it. And the first thing they did, one of the first things, I'm skipping a lot of stuff actually, but one of the first oh, things yeah. is they said, what is the helper? What's the helper? So they uh, have a collection of phages and they just put one at a time in the E. coli and see which one can rescue this, uh, this satellite. Uh, and uh, they found two phages, HK106 and 446, that could uh, rescue out this... Uh, this uh, satellite and that's what they use for the for the rest of the paper and so they look at the uh, these satellites that are encapsulated in these other phages and they f they look by electron microscopy uh, and you can see um, they they're normal looking uh, phages but they're two kinds of particles they're they're ones that are um, uh, bigger the fa the helper particles are bigger and the uh, the satellite particles are smaller and it's really easy to tell in the electron micrographs of the figures it sure is and and they both have the same tail apparently yes which is the whole point here is that yeah so if you look at the em um a very pretty em it's nothing like a picture no you can see two different head sizes and um just stuck on what looks like the same tail. Very cool. So apparently this uh, satellite, it has, a, it has quite a name, ECCIEDL933. So it doesn't really flow off the tongue. No. But it can make small capsids with its own proteins encoded in its own genome. 
and uh, it, use, it it's attached to the tail from uh, the helper phage. So again, the, the helper is responsible for the for making large caps. It's for itself, but the satellite ha encodes proteins to make a small capsid, which can only package the helper the the satellite DNA because the helper is too big to fit in there. And then the, the tail comes from the uh, the helper virus. And so they do some interesting genetics. They introduce stop codons uh, to, uh, to, to cause a stop in the genes that are part of the packaging module of this, uh, of this satellite. Uh, and so the, 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 when they do that, the, uh, they don't get the, the formation of satellites because they're totally dependent on uh, this packaging module. And also you can use that to show that the... Um, you could you can do this experiment do southern blots to look at the size of the the genome which tells you whether it's helper or satellite and you can see uh, in, if you knock out the uh, packaging module with these stop codons you only get dna which is the size of the helper and not the um, and you can and you can actually purify the particles separately to do that experiment and they did Rich's favorite technique. They did plaque assays. They do plaque assays, yeah. And you know you're in a prokaryotic world because the titers are in the 10 to the 10 PFUs hmm. per mil. Indeed, mil. indeed. They also uh, do some experiments where they purify the helper or the satellite. They can do protein analysis and they can show that the capsid is clearly coming from the helper and the tail is uh, and the, and the satellite proteins are from uh, satellite and the tail is from from the helper as well which is on both very cool they also do sequencing to show this they can sequence the dna and show you that the the dna in the large capsids is all helper and the dna in the small capsids is the satellite all, all cool experiments and they did a little bit of mass spec they to do mass look spec at as well the yeah. protein yep exactly right I'm not doing any switching here. See, this is a problem with live switching yourself. So what do I mean by live? You need a director. You need a director. So here I would say, if I'm going to do talking for the next five minutes, maybe you want to look at me. And then if suddenly Michael Schmidt says something, like... Then I have to Then I would back. bring him back. I would bring Michael back. And then if Michael's saying something on his own, we could bring him by himself... And then if you want us back again, you do this. It's called live switching. And um, I don't know that I can do that and talk about a paper at the same time. No. <laughs> it, it may be easier when we have our compatriots, Michelle and Petra. Uh, and uh, you just have to be the director. Well, when I'm not doing a paper, it's fine. Right? Yeah. So that's that's. So have you thing. experimented with this on, on TWIV where you have sometimes as many as six hosts? Oh boy, I have not. I have not. Yeah, that would be something. That's where I need a. I mean, you can have a, a remote. Director. You can have a remote director doing this. Okay. Yes. It doesn't have to be in the same room because they just log on to this. They don't get their their camera on and they just listen and switch. But uh, and and Vincent and I are seeing each other in the live stream and we're we're not delayed i mean my lips are moving as i'm speaking it's pretty good actually because yeah some of the other software that i use there's a delay and yeah. uh, of course now both of our internet connections are good yeah they're good and stable today are you on wi-fi or wired i am on wi-fi but i get a 200 gigabit uh, can a uh, 200 megabyte per second connection. Yeah, I experimented with my Wi-Fi at the house. I'm at the house today because I didn't want to be interrupted as I got my paper ready. Yeah, I, I'm on wired Ethernet here, but sometimes uh, some of the hosts have slow Wi-Fi and their their image degrades. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how this uh, yes. this package handles it. I have not used this for any other show. This is the first. I thought, and this is dangerous. Don't try this at home, you know, in a production situation where we're actually recording a podcast. You shouldn't try a brand new package without having experimented before. But, uh, with but that's just why two they're of experiments. Us, 
That's why they're experimenting. Yeah, with just two of us, it's fine. And Michael's patient. He gets it. He doesn't have to run off. So this is a perfect situation. But it's, it is very simple to use. Um, and seems yeah. to be working very well so far. So they say now we sh we propose that this satellite 933 is a prototypical member of a new family, which we call capsid forming PICIs, right? Uh, prokaryote. What is PICI again? I forgot. Phage inducible phage inducible yes. chromosomal islands. So now it's going to be capsid forming PICIs, and uh, they can make their capsid except for the tail, and you need the tail. And as Michael said, they did mass direct to spec to confirm that the only protein from the phage, the helper phage, in these uh, satellite viruses is the tail. Mm -hmm. and, and they can alter the gene. They could mutate the gene for the tail and show that the, neither the host, nor the helper, nor the satellite get a tail when you do that. A lot of good biochemistry and genetics uh, in this page, in this paper. Now, the other yeah, aspect of this um, is that, as I said, most um, satellites block the rep reproduction of their helpers or in inhibit it. But in this case, they find that the helpers do not are not affected by the presence of this um, satellite virus. They do some plaque assays, uh, and uh, the the presence of the satellite does not decrease uh, the yields of the helper viruses. So they say th this, uh, this 933 is a satellite is not a parasite, but it's a commensal, at least uh, in their hands. So are there others? Of course, that's the obligate question. They do, mm -hmm. they do genomic mining to address this question, and they look across GenBank databases. They find lots of P uh, capsid-forming, PICIs in proteobacteria, and they also find them in the firmicutes, including Lactococcus, Enterococcus, Bacillus, Clostridium, and Staphylococcus. And they, you could see, you could just say, are there capsid genes in the module for these satellites? And they can find that very readily. And they also f do some phylogenetic analysis, which suggests that there are three independent groups of capsid-forming uh, PICIs that appear to have uh, arisen uh, independently. Oh, but w one thing you may be um, asking, are, is there any relationship between the satellite and the, f and the helper phage? And there is none. Mm -mm. Satellites are not derived from the helper. They're not defective forms of the helper. They are independent viruses with an independent origin. How they arose is a good question. They probably were uh, independently reproducing viruses at one point, and then they may have been in a co-infection, and they lost uh, I think it was gene. lysogeny. It I was think it was lysogeny. lysogeny, and it was an aberrant excision like we see in lysogeny mm -hmm. quite often, and they lost the uh, phage head, uh, or the tail fiber moiety. In this case, and, yeah. And consequently, remember the virus is indifferent to the transacting factors. It's all self-assembly. And it's if you had another lysogen in the cell that was producing uh, a tail fiber at the time that the lysogenic switch was thrown then evolution would take over and said, can I use this tail fiber? Sure. And yeah. just tack it on. And that's probably how it arose. And though you'd have to do some sophisticated genomic tracking to, to look at the nucleotide changes to really characterize it, but it really is, is quite fascinating. And as I was reading this, I was asking myself, what about the biotechnology opportunities here. Could you effectively engineer it so that the lytic form of this would go and infect your microbiome mm. so it would make good things for you? You know, sure. engineer yeah. a gene into the new phage that would make something that your body couldn't make that would then diffuse across your uh, endoepithelial layer in your gut. Yeah. 
So your so, idea is uh, that this was a defective excision, and then there happened to be a helper in that cell that could provide it, and that started the association. Yeah, right? because remember, there are multiple attachment sites. I mean, think about the the virus that everyone sort of has an understanding of, Lambda. There's a phage attachment site in Lambda and E. coli, and it goes in. But if it doesn't find that site, Lambda can go in elsewhere, too. You know, yeah, it'll sure, just find sure. a landing site. And and so there's all, you know, um, you know, quoting Jeff Goldblum from Jurassic Park, nature always finds a way. Oh, yeah. He didn't make that up. No, the writers of Jurassic Park did, but I don't remember the writers of Jurassic Park. Maybe it was Michael Crichton and they who probably wrote got the it original from, line. They probably got it from some evolutionary textbook, right? Yeah. nature always finds a way. Yes. It's fascinating. When you, and you want to find new ways, you just have to look. That's the thing. That's what yes. they were doing here. They stumbled on it as they were looking. And that's what you have to do in science. You cannot have your head in the ground. <laughs> and, and it's also, it, it, it screams volumes about in investigator-derived uh, investigational science where you're just asking what do we see here? And they were intrigued and they investigated further and had this fascinating result. All right, that's our snippet. And now on to Michael. So today we're doing a paper that appeared in Applied in Environmental Microbiology. And its title is Yersinia pestis delta AIL. And I'm just going to refer to those as AL mutants are susceptible to human complement bactericidal activity in the flea. And it's by Kolajek, Bearden, May, Mice, uh, Montaneri, Gage, Hoved, and Minnick. And they are at the Department of Animal and Veterinary and Food Science at the University of Idaho and the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases at the CDC in Fort Collins, Colorado. Given the recent coverage of the raccoon dog versus the lab leak controversy, who would not love the first lines from this manuscript and not marvel at how far our understanding of the double helix has gone since its first description by Watson and Crick back in March of 1953? And I don't think we've mentioned this is the 70th anniversary of the double helix. And the 70, of, 70, that's right. I'm 70. I was born in 1953. <laughs> so you're as old as DNA, Vincent. Well, DNA is many, many years older than me. Yeah, but many, I'm, many I'm, years I'm older. I'm as old as the uh, discovery, the, the interpretation of the structure as a double helix, right? Yes, the Watson, and, the Watson crickery, as they say. So um, the disciplines of microbiology and its close partners, immunology and infectious diseases, have certainly advanced substantially since the time of Koch, Pasteur, and even Watson and Crick. The lines that I'd like to commend to your attention are in the introduction of this manuscript, and they really help set the stage for the work that we're going to review and can help in your being able to defend science uh, amongst the naysayers who think it was a lab leak and, you know, how do you defend it? So here's the quote. Ancient DNA surveys from Neolithic and Bronze Age human remains unexpectedly contain full genomic sequences of Yersinia pestis, the gram-negative bacterium that causes plague. These sequences compared against genomes of modern Yersinia have provided what is perhaps the most complete evolutionary trajectory of a zoonotic human pathogen with a resolution to the nucleotide. Now, Yersinia pestis diverged recently, and in a molecular clock sense, that's less than 20,000 years ago. So recently is less than 20,000 years. From an enteric predecessor, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis as an enzoonotic strain belonging to the Pestides cluster. Their appearance was followed by a binary split around 6,500 years ago and produced strains more frequently 
associated with human disease. And that ends the quote. But wait, this paper has so much more. And as the editors of AEM tease the readers, and this is how I found the paper, and their papers and their and their sections of note section of the journal, they entitled this manuscript, How Your Cinea Pestis Got Its Pathogenic Groove. Well, I've already shared with you the actual title of this paper. It's a bit more reserved, but the title offered by the editors does provide us insight in that it offers that Yersinia pestis, this Delta Al mutant, is not susceptible to human complement bactericidal activity in a flea. And as we work our way through this paper, I hope you'll develop an idea of how this global plague evolved from its innocuous enteric predecessor to this, you know, pandemic causing that was responsible literally for the dark ages from the Middle Ages. We'll see how horizontal gene transfer may have played a role in influencing the development or, if you will, enhancement of virulence while certain officials of the Great Plague Era might have wished to blame the Medicis of Florence, Italy for engineering pestas, we're going to learn it was nothing more than the biology of the bacterium and how its passage through its host, the flea and the animal host, and then through the magic or the mystery of selection pressure, simply enhanced fitness which in turn contributed not only to its virulence, but greatly to human history. And how, can among it, the, how can it be so sure that um, the bacteria is inherently more virulent? Is, aren't, aren't there contributions of the host as well? There are indeed. I mean, we all know about CCR5 and yeah. the genetic selection of CCR5. We, we learned that... Uh, that actually conferred some selective advantage to the host to not dying from uh, a plague infection. But, you know, it, it's, a, it's a manuscript that appeared in AEM and they can't go into all the details. So Yeah, the reason know, I, I ask is because for viruses, we have not, in my opinion, and I've looked at, I've st thought about this for 40 years. And if you've thought about it, not you, Michael, but you out there, if you've thought about it longer, let me know what you think. Um, I don't know of an example of a virus that's become more virulent. Certainly they become more fit and they can have other properties as a consequence. But, you know, Why, I, in viruses, it doesn't make sense to uh, kill your, to evolve to kill your host. It, I don't get it unless somehow you're selecting for higher viral yields to improve transmission, which is highly selectable, and that collaterally improves virulence. I would, I would buy that, but I don't see any evidence for that. I, mean, I guess for bacteria, uh, I think it's all, the same it's idea, trophism. right? It's trophism, where the infection goes. And we'll, we'll see a little bit about that okay. in this paper. So one of the first things to uh, appreciate is among the identified virulence factors associated with Yersinia pestis, or as some of you can tell, my voice is not up to scratch and I had uh, acute viral lar laryngitis all last week and I could barely squeak, uh, but fortunately the voice is coming back. The uh, I'm just gonna call this the plague bacterium or just pestis, is the attachment invasion locus protein or AIL that I just call AL that is required to protect pestis from serum complement killing activity in all mammals, underscore the word all mammals tested except mice. The sera of mice is not bactericidal to this microbe. Rat sera is perfectly bactericidal. Mice sera, not so much. And so this study asked the fundamental question, is bactericidal sera, principally in the form of complement, able to kill Yersinia pestis and colonize fleas? Now, here's a spoiler alert if you want to read the paper cold. Um, 
turn off your headset for a second, the authors are going to go going to demonstrate that it was not. So the importance of this observation is that it identifies or calls out or shouts at it, shouts at us that the gut of the flea is likely a protective niche or environment for the growth of serum sensitive and serum non-sensitive strains of pestis. So in other words, nothing nefarious by the Medici's went on in the mid 1300s in Florence, Italy. It was just straightforward selection and adaptation with likely a dose of type three secretion and facultative intracellular parasitism thrown in and a little bit of genetic exchange that made this pathogen the beast that it became. So first, some background. Plague cycles between a mammalian host and a flea vector. Those of us who have ever been to trailheads in the uh, Southwest or Western United States National Parks, or even at Lake Tahoe, have seen the sign warning signs to check for fleas, to avoid chipmunks. And in fact, plague can affect a wide range of mammals, including the felid family, rabbits, dogs, primates. However, the primary mammalian reservoir are rodents and shrews. So the fact is vector porn transmission to mammalian species is determined by flea feeding preferences. And so when the primary host population is decimated by the disease, the flea will simply feed on other mammalian species that become, if you will, a bridge vector to humans. And so Yersinia pestis can infect people by a flea bite. We know that as bubonic plague. It can also get us by the direct deposition of bacteria into our blood through contact with body fluids or tissue or an infected mammal, and that's septicemic plague, or simply by the inhalation of aerosolized plague, which went on in mid-century 1300 Italy, uh, which is known as pneumonic plague. And septicemic and pneumonic plague are the deadliest form of the disease, but the bubonic plague is the most common. And it results in the formation of a boo-boo, it's likely the first medical term that we all likely learn from our mothers. However, what my mother didn't appreciate is the subtlety of flea-borne transmission to mammals. In the early phase where the flea is infected with a blood meal that has the pestis bacterium, this generally takes about a week after it has consumed the blood meal. It's not very efficient at transmitting plague to others. Uh, yet this phase of its life cycle is still significant for plague maintenance. But the hallmark of late phase flea infection is biofilm formation on the proventriculus, which is a valve between the esophagus and the midgut of the flea that prevents backflow of the blood meal. However, pestis can form a biofilm. And as this structure expands, the pestis-based biofilm expands, it restricts the entrance of future blood meals to the midgut. And as you might imagine, the flea fails to receive any blood despite its continuous feeding so the flea becomes hangry and goes on a feeding frenzy, continuously seeking food. And as you might imagine, each time, each time it bites a new host, it spreads a bit of plague and gorge spit into the blood meal victim as it regurgitates into the flea's esophagus and onto the mammalian skin bite. So it's the fleas with late stage transmission and not the Medici's of 1350 Italy who were responsible for efficient pestis transmission. And, and that was principally in the form of the body louse uh, or human fleas. 
And one additional bit of the microbiological background to help us digest, no pun intended, the data of this paper is that the bacterial gene for flea colonization and bioform, biofilm formation mm -hmm. are regulated by a temperature-dependent transcriptional and post-transcriptional factors that we're not going to cover in this manuscript, but they give references so you can dig into that. So, now, Michael, the um, I have a question for you. The you know th these the strains diverged, right? Sixty yes. five hundred years ago, and and uh, that produced strains associated with human disease. Is do these strains differ in their ability to make the biofilm on the uh, on the esophageal valve there? No, they both can do it. It's just one makes a more severe disease than the other. Okay. Yes. And it it's probably has to do with trophism, moving out of the enteric system and into being able to cross out of the gut into the circulatory system where it becomes septem septicemic and then yeah. ultimately infecting the lungs. Again, these microbes recall part of their biology is their facultative intracellular parasites, yeah. principally through type 3 secretion, which was uh, one of the earliest type 3 secretion systems was worked out in Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. And so we mm. understand a lot about these effector molecules, enabling them to be phagocytized and then growing inside eukaryotic cells. And it's really an elegant form of, of the biology. And, and we haven't covered a lot about facultative intracellular parasites, but our co-host Michelle Swanson works with one of the 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 champs, Legionella, didn't that we, lives inside cells. Didn't we do the regurgitation in the flea story? It was out of a lab at Rocky Mountain NIH, yes. right? Joe, what? What's his name? Joseph. You know who I'm talking uh, I'm about? Blank. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, but I'm blanking on his name. All right, I'm going to look it up while you. You, you look it up. I'm going to go and give us our immunology dose for the day. Now for the immunology background. When your body senses a pathogen through the pathogen-associated molecular pattern molecules, the immunologists simply abbreviate that as a PAMP. Now, these, these pattern molecules are resident on the microbe surface. They are in turn recognized by pattern recognition receptor or PRR bearing cells of the innate immune system. If you will, the innate immune system is our first responder, which in this case is complement. That immunological sequence that many of us committed to memory and then promptly forgot after the test. So a bit of review. Complement activation generates a series of effector proteins that lead to the formation of a membrane attack complex that all the immunologists call just call MAC. But that should we should always mm. explain it the first time as a membrane attack complex. A Big Mac, Michael. It's a Big Mac. It's a Big Mac. And that forms <laughs> MAC forms membrane penetrating pores on the microbial surface. Now you know why the bacterium dies. Once you destroy that energized membrane, you make no energy. The cell begins to leak. It's a train wreck. The cell quickly, quickly dies. Now, complement can be activated by three biochemical pathways. The classical, or as I think of it, the rupturing of the membrane, which results in that very quick death. Then there's the alternative pathway, which simply just facilitates the pathogen's consumption by phagocytes by the deposition of opsonizing agents. In other words, C3B puts opsonizing antigens onto the bacterium that then target it for destruction. Mm -hmm. And then the third pathway is there's a lectin pathway, which I've always viewed as the fire alarm supplemental box code. Both my brothers are firemen, so I learned lots about box alarms and box codes. And the fire alarm box code calling for more companies just means, okay, send in the macrophages, send in neutrophils and inflammation. 
And that's what the third form or the lectin form of, of this goes on. Now, each version of the complement cascade induces an enzyme called the C3 convertase, which are enzymes that cleave C3 component of the complement cascade into anaphylatoxin, which is C3A, and then opsin, which is C3B. Now, this catalytic step in the complement cascade amplifies the reaction to decorate the microbial surface with the C3B component upon which the MAC or membrane attack complex assembles, which ultimately destroys the cell. So summing our immunology lesson up for the day, complement neutralization is a key virulence attribute of bloodborne pathogen. It effectively will knock out our first responders or send the firemen back to their house because it, it just knocks out complement. Now, maintenance of transmission cycles between preferred and incidental vector hosts requires serum resistance in both. You have to be resistant to complement. Even though plague has been around for literally millennia, we still don't know the definitive suite of pestis virulence factors necessary to cause disease. What we do know is that resistance to human complement is an absolute requirement. Now, it's been hypothesized that it was the acquisition of serum resistance to human complement that was likely the pivotal point for pestis to become the human pandemic pathogen it became. Now, one last piece concerning the discernment of virulence factors, or if you will, the evolution or adaptation from the related enteric pathogens of pseudotuberculosis and enterocolitia, enterocolitia was the outer membrane protein, GADA and AL, in concert with the O antigen of LPS, are serum resistance factors in these two other microbes. Now, interestingly, the genes coding for pestis YAD-A in the O antigen, which confers serum resistance in the enteric pathogens, tuber pseudotuberculosis and enercolytica, are absent. They've been lost by mutation, leaving AL as the single res serum resistance factor in pestis. So let me emphasize that again. AL is the single serum resistance factor for plague. So when we only have one virulence factor to worry about, we, we can begin to do some pretty cool experiments. And that with, that's what the authors are going to walk us through. Now, these authors have previously published that AL confers resistance to human and rat sera at the host temperature. So that our host temperature is 37 degrees. So if you have AL, you're resistant to complement in humans. And if uh, the rat gets bit, it's also um, that pestis is going to be resistant to rat complement. And a pestis deletion of AL makes it sensitive to sera from humans and rats with the deletion mutants dying within one hour of exposure. So this observation then extends the death of the microbe being conferred by sera from other mammals. Specifically, you have goats, you have sheep, you have rabbits and guinea pigs. So again, AL is important for serum resistance. The problem is, is that mouse serum is not bactericidal to delta L mutants. So these are deletion mutants of L. They're not mutations in the L protein. They are, are excuse me, the L gene that will then ultimately result in a different protein. These are deletions. And there's no difference in survival found between a wild type pestis strain, delta L mutants, or a delta L mutant that is complemented by a good copy of AL. So where to go? Well, species-specific bactericidal action of complement 
against the Delta Al mutants at lower extra host temperatures has not been confirmed. So the authors thought, well, maybe it's getting in uh, because it's um, going through uh, the 28 degrees flea. So the next step that they did, and that's what this paper is about, is they tested various sera at extra host temperatures or the temperature the pathogen would find itself in the flea, which in this case is 28 degrees. And the question then whether Yersinia pestis can colonize and survive in the colder flea in the presence sera. Now, one final twist you need to know is that AL is not required for colonization in the flea, feeding on a blood meal from a mouse, whereas uh, where complement from the mouse is not bactericidal. So you, you sort of begin to see the selection pressure that can be mounted in mice. So the authors evaluated whether AL was required to protect pestis in the Oracilla Montana flea fed human blood meal, meals containing a bactericidal component. So let me again say this so we all keep this straight. The fleas are eating human blood. So they have a bactericidal version of complement in their gut. And we're asking if Al can protect them against human complement killing at flea temperatures. So the first experiment they did in vitro, but rest assured, we'll eventually get to the flea. So what they <laughs> did is I think once you appreciate what they're evaluating, you understand why I digressed into the basic complement biology and why I digressed into so much background, is the first question is what is the role of AL in C3B deposition on the pestis surface at mammalian hosts in flea vector temperatures. Now, the complement cascade is activated very rapidly with its components being deposited on the pestis surface at both mammalian and flea temperatures. Human serum killed the Delta Al mutants at 37 degrees within one hour, our body temp, and to ask what it would do at the flea temperatures or 28 degrees screen, 28 degrees C, they screened three types of uh, pestis strains, the wild type, Delta Al, and then Delta Al complemented in trans with a good copy of Al. They used two types of sera in their assay. The first one was 50% normal human serum, and the other sera that they used was heat and activated. And they did the plus and minus experiment at 28 and 37 degrees. Heat and activated human serum knocks off the activity of complement. So it's effectively killing the complement. So their first experiment was just straight up immunostaining. They used a polyclonal antibody that detects uh, antibodies against C3. Mm -hmm. And they simply imaged it. And they asked to see whether or not C3 was decorating the bacterium, whether it was binding. And the immunofluorescent imaging experiment detected human C3B on the surfaces of wild type, the Delta Al mutant within 15 minutes exposure to normal uh, human serum at both the mammalian host temp of 37 degrees and the 28 degree C temperature. So the complement cascade was activated rapidly with its with both with its components being deposited on the pestis surface at both temperatures. Only the Delta Al mutants show signs of lysis that include swelling and rounding after 60 minutes of incubation at either temperature. Mm -hmm. Now, this phenotype was not observed in the wild type or it wasn't observed. And the C3B and the heat kill serum controls 
uh, they didn't detect any decoration of the bacteria. In addition, in this first experiment, they did single cell quantification of C3B using immunofluorescent imaging, and they showed C3B deposition on the pestis surfaces was al dependent. And significantly larger amounts mm. of C3B were found on the Delta Al mutants compared to the wild type or at either 28 or 37 degrees. And collectively, they interpreted that the data were suggesting that the human complement cascade is still activated rapidly after contact with pestis at 28 degrees and the Delta Al mutant showed signs of lysis within one hour. But remember that this creature is a facultative intracellular parasite. So it's it's got to get its D done before uh, that one hour. So I, th I think timing is going to be of the essence in helping them ultimately decipher this. In addition, lysis correlated with increased um, C3B on the surface of the cells. In the next experiment, they ask if other than human sera was bactericidal against the Del Delta Al mutant at the lower or flea temperature. And here they used um, rat and mouse sera were tested. Again, the same drill, wild type Delta Al and Delta Al complemented at 28 degrees and 50% human rat or mouse serum for zero, 60, or 150 minutes. Here they switched it up a little and they did a viable count and assessed whether the bacteria were alive. The control that they used, and this is important, as we know that heat inactivated sera has no complement mediated killing. So this gives you a set point of what 100% growth is. Then you can compare the death percentage imparted by the rat human or mouse era, and the data are pretty easy to interpret in their figure. Parental and complemented strains retain full viability at all time points. Rat and human sera were similarly bactericidal for the Delta Al mutant. And the mouse serum was not lethal as there was no different in survival between the three strains. Bottom lining these observations, they offered that this was the bactericidal effects of human and rat complement against the Delta mutant occurred at the lower flea temperature. So where to next? They next asked because mouse sera failed to kill the Delta mutant, could the mouse sera inhibit the bactericidal effects of other sera, if you will, the mouse serum is going to confer or have some complementary activity. Some transacting factor in the mouse sera was going to protect the bacterium either by decorating it or some such thing. So here, they mix human and mouse serum in a one-to-one -one ratio and ask the question, can mouse serum confer protection to the bacterium from human serum ki killing? What they saw was that after 90 minutes, no Delta mutant cells survive, similar to incubation alone with human serum. So the mouse serum didn't confer anything great to it. Further pre-exposure of the bacteria for one hour to mouse sera did not suppress the bactericidal effect of human sera compared to controls. Again, they bottom line this for us, the mouse sera did not suppress the bactericidal activities of human sera. So what are the implications? Well, this result suggests human serum should remain bactericidal against the Delta Al mutant in the flea vector, even if the flea had previously fed on a host with ineffective complement, the mouse. Next, we need to go back to the poor starving flea or the biofilm plugging up the works. Previous workers in the field have shown that in the late stages of mouse flea infections, al-dependent autoaggregation of Yersinia pestis is not required for late stages of biofilm formation or the um, blockage of the proviculous valve at four weeks post-infections. 
The plague was transmissible from fleas to mammalian hosts during the early stages of infection when uh, flea blockage had, had not yet occurred. So the formation of bacteria aggregates in the flea gut occurs early. So the final series was to determine if AL-mediated Yersinia pestis autoaggregation is important for early stage flea colonization infections in wild type pestis, the Delta Al mutant, or the Delta Al uh, that had a complementation by a good copy of Al. And they suspended uh, mouse whole blood and they evaluated this at 72 hours. So we're in the flea where a total of 50 fleas are evaluated using the three different strains, and they're evaluated for infection prevalence and bacterial numbers. And when you look at figure four, they don't look any difference, and you don't see any stars over the graphs. And the results, infection prevalence was not different and averaged equivalently at about 65% for the usual suspects, wild type, Delta Al, and the complemented version. So what, this, what did this experiment teach him? Al and its auto-aggregation phenotype are not required for the early stage of pestis flea colonization. Up to now, we've been in vitro. Now let's assess whether human complement, which recall is bacteriocidal against Delta Al at 28 degrees, had the same effect when the deletion strain was evaluated in a flea. So we're now in the whole flea after a human blood meal. Again, it's basically a rerun of the previous experiments, except we're now in fleas feeding them sterile human or mouse blood. Here again, infection prevalence and bacterial numbers were no different for the Delta Al mutant compared to the other strains. Whereas if you recall that when the studies were done in vitro, human complement was bactericidal against the Delta mutant, even when the mixed with the mouse here. So here they learned that exposure of the Delta Al mutants to human blood in the flea gut did not reduce the bacterial numbers. Putting us all together, the Delta Al mutant was sensitive to human sera at 28 degrees in vitro. Mouse serum is not lethal to the Delta Al mutant. And when mixing mice with lethal human sera, they saw that the mutation offered no protection. Then they finally asked if the Delta Al mutant established in the fleas feeding on mouse blood could survive when the fleas were switched to human blood. And surprisingly, they learned that when the Delta L mutant levels in the fleas were not affected compared to wild type fleas or the control fleas maintained on mouse blood. And this in vitro, in vivo result implies that the fleas somehow are rapidly inactivating human complement upon blood ingestion of Yersinia pestis growing in fleas and they're protected in some manner from the complement activity. Now this inactivation or prevention from complement could therefore maintain a murine reservoir of pestis strains with a heterogeneous complement sensitivity, which can drive natural selection even when the fleas change the mammalian host, when the biofilm takes over and they go on their feeding frenzy, biting anything that is around just so they get a blood meal, but the blood meal can't go down because the biofilm has clogged the pipe. Hmm. And this then takes us to the final experiment where they showed avirulent or lowly virulent natural isolates of pestis are sensitive and displayed an altered al amino acid sequence. And then through a very neat set of experiments where they cloned these al variants from serum sensitive uh, pestis and express it in serum sensitive um, pestis wild type, 
the Delta Al mutant, they there were then able to sh- demonstrate that serum resistance was restored by the Al protein. So summing all of this up, this study focused on the role of Al in the flea vector. The observation was Pestis Delta Al mutant was not affected by murine serum, but was rapidly killed by a human or rat sera in vitro. Fleas can be colonized with Pesta Delta Al mutant while feeding on mouse blood. The wild bit they observed was that the Delta Al mutant of Pestis colonized in a flea when fed human blood, they were unaffected. Now, this observation offers that human complement is somehow being in, rapidly inactivated by fleas upon blood ingestion, thus leading them to conclude that Al was not required for pestis survival in the flea insofar that it was grown on mouse blood. Again, bottom line in all of this, the principal question asked, is bactericidal sera from humans active in pestis colonized fleas? The take home is it was not. Mm-hmm. Offering to all of us that this is a great space for selection in exchange, the flea gut, an enhancement or attenuation to take place, or as they offers, offer, it's a protective niche for the growth of serum-sensitive and non-sensitive pestis strains. And it's going to be what drives the selection of future pestis strains. And, you know, the mnemonic form of plague hasn't been around for quite, quite some time. So maybe we selected out or Hmm. the human race became resistant to it. So it's a fascinating story on plague. It's a great story. And by the way, I found the uh, guy I was looking for, Joe Hindebush. Joe Hindebush. That's right, Hindebush. It was episode number 60 of TWIM. Uh, Oh, oh, no, sorry, 80. That was back in 2014. You were not there. It was me, Alio, and Michelle. Uh, That's why I probably forgot. Here is the story. So Yersinia pseudotuberculosis causes a benign lower tract infection in the flea. It gained a gene called YMT. It it encodes a phospholipase D, and that allows mid-gut infection. It lost three genes that enhance biofilm formation to promote transmissibility by blocking that valve, as you were saying, uh, and four other genes uh, enabled fleaborne transmission. But the um, th- that's what happened. They they the, the strain changed and allowed biofilm formation, which allows it to be regurgitated and and transmitted, among other things as well. And I thought that was a brilliant, brilliant story. And when I visited the lab sometime later, I talked with Joe and uh, got the inside scoop. Really cool stuff. Very, very rarely do you get to understand what happened uh, like we did for, with this one. And so I dropped into the show notes a bit of a compliment review for everyone who's forgotten their compliment. Uh, it's, it's from Jim's favorite source, um, um, uh, Wikipedia. And, or Rich, excuse me, not Jim, Rich. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, I also put uh, the plague warning sign that's in, at the trailhead at Lake Tahoe uh, for our producer, Ray Ortega, who was uh, in the Sacramento News. Uh, so, back Michael, in the, the, the kind of plague you would get from the, these animals in the wild, this is pneumonic? No, bubonic. You, get, you develop a boo-boo. Uh, typically, it drains into the lymph node and it's a swelling and you feel like crap. And, and this is, how would, how would you get it from these animals? By by inhalation? Uh, by a flea, by a flea, a flea bite. A flea bite, okay. Yeah, and the, a flea uh, bite from the animal. So they tell you to check for flea bites and tick bites uh, when you're out in the woods. Right. And so, so the trail had warnings. And um, there's a nice little sign telling you not to play with chipmunks or feed chipmunks. And right. So in Europe, the, the plagues were caused by a bubonic version right the no cause. pneumonic it pneumonic. was always pneumonic it, it was it was an infected the human lice so so we not, were actually not fleas. the host not fleas not fleas human lice the body louse lovely. which is really just lovely human just lovely human fleas and th- those 
that, that those strains do not exist in the in the southwest of the U.S. Is that correct? They don't. They haven't crossed the Mississippi yet. They they're they're throughout the United States, and the great mighty Mississippi is the barrier. To What's play. harboring them? What kind of animals? Rodents. Rodents, principally prairie dogs in in the Midwest, and um, you know they they just um, they, it's a tolerant in, infection. It it doesn't have the same um, mnemonic behaviors that we saw in the body louse in humans. So why was it so bad in the Dark Ages, what was the reason? Probably crowding, probably crowding, mm -hmm. um, living in the slums of cities. Maybe overall and poor health, right? Poor health, poor nutrition. Mm. And so your immune system was suppressed. And, you know, nutrition has done great things. Yep. And um, so it's, you, if, it's, if you get plagued today, what, how are you treated? You're given two antibiotics. Uh -huh. And, uh, because they're typically facultative intracellular parasites, so you need the antibiotics to get into the cell. And they're get, you're generally given two targets based on susceptibilities. Uh, and it's important that you get treated very quickly before it goes septic, before it begins to get into your bloodstream. Interesting. All right. Yeah, plague is, plague is plague's still out there and... You know, but you can see in, in today's great debate of who caused the plague, you could see the same discussion going on in 1350 with the Medicis. So, so they brought it in from from China. I Again, see. remember, plague came from China. I see. Uh, that's where the original plague uh, emigrated out of along the Great Silk Route. Um as you know, the Great Silk Trade Route uh, brought plague to Europe. Well, you know, Michael, humans are their own worst enemy. We're nomads. We we like to wander, and uh, you know, we bring all our luggage with us. Indeed. Well, we could talk about plague a lot. Um, I think it's fascinating, and you know, potentials for future pandemics and all that sort of thing. But the other thing I dropped into the show notes is a TED Ed five minute video right. on calculating your risks of another pandemic. I don't know if you've actually seen that five minute calculating video, but it, it I saw it yesterday at TEDx Charleston, and it was quite fascinating. And it's uh, it's it's nicely animated, and so you might enjoy it. All right, let's take a look. I just tried to load it, and it said bad. Well, there it is URL. now. There we go. Will there be another pandemic in your lifetime? Well, there will be. It's a matter of what causes it, right? But um, they go through the calculus of, of figuring out how those calculations are done. It's it's a rather interesting um, take on things. And, it, and again, it's a major argument for why we need to consider discovery-based science. So they say, what's the probability of another world-changing pandemic? So I agree that this was a world changer like 1918. And I don't think we will have another one of these for a while. But we will have, you know, flu pandemics that are less world-changing, right? They the will la continue. The last I mean, one was 2009. So we are getting uh, about that time. The one before 2009 was 1977. How many years is that? The swine flu. That's... Uh, Nine, they're generally 13, general. 20. They're generally general gener, generational, you know, as the <laughs> immunity begins to wane. Um, well, we had the, one in the strains. 60s. The strains are quite different, so you have to. Uh, it will evade if so. Nineteen sixty-eight was H three N two, and then two thousand and nine was H one N one. So nobody who had H three N two was going to be immune. So that's and the then key. we had another pandemic in fifty seven. That's right. I don't remember that one, though. I was only four. Yeah, I, I, I was not around for that either. All right. That is TWIM 285. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIM. You can send your questions and comments to us. We love to get them. TWIM at microbe.tv. And if you like the work that we do here on these podcasts, please consider supporting us. We need your support to continue we do a lot of them. We have expenses, microbe.tv slash contribute. You don't need to give a lot, but it's all tax deductible. Even if you decide a buck a month, if you all did a buck a month, 
uh, we'd be set. I wouldn't have to ask you. It's like NPR, right? They say That's we, right. if you give up, if you give your money, we won't bother you anymore. <laughs> Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Vincent. Enjoyed it today. I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.